Welcome to Amusement Sparks, the amateur theme park design show. This is your host, Andrew Spawn, and we've got two guests today. These come from one of my new favorite podcasts. Uh, it's called Cinema 7, and that's spelled the number 7, E-V-E-N. Um, will you guys introduce yourselves? Who the heck are you? I am uh, John Kenoki, uh one-third of Cinema 7. And to my virtual right, we have... I'm Chris Hawk. I'm the member of Cinema 7 that never stops laughing. That's what he's known for. <laughs> awesome. So what do you guys do on your podcast? So uh, we, we basically cover all forms of entertainment from, you know, movies to games to TV shows, whatever whatever's relevant. Uh, we kind of do in-depth conversations just talking about where things are coming from thought-wise to, you know, what they're trying to do, whether it be just money grabs or, you know, something artistic. Uh, we also have some fun episodes where we go back and watch movies from, uh, you know when, you know, early 2000s to the 60s. And then we have other episodes where we uh, pitch random movies. So, for instance, uh, we pitched a Mace Windu movie where, um, you know, Chris Hawk had some interesting ideas about who Mace Windu <laughs> should be uh, going up against but you know that's what we do cool it's it's an awesome show and you know there's a lot of podcasts out there that kind of like review media and like give their thoughts on it but it's you guys are like a totally different genre you like you've like totally transcended that in my opinion like so many of them are just people like oh yeah i kind of remember that movie you know i watched it in theaters three years ago blah 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 like they're just kind of talking without doing any research or putting any real thought into it and like I don't know, listening to your guys' show is so much more enjoyable than that because, like, you actually provide some, like, legitimate, like, insights and actual thoughts and, I don't know, it, it's, like, it's just next level. I don't even know how to, else to describe it. Um, and then, yeah, your your Pitch It or Fix It episodes are, are some of my favorites. It's so fun to, like, get a little bit creative with it, you know? Like, how could they have done this better? Or what's my idea for this movie that's that's coming out or should be coming out? Yeah, so it's, it's just great. I would definitely recommend the listener go check it out. All right, so um, our warm-up segment here on Amusement Sparks is called Toynado, and I don't know what this has to do with amusement parks, but, you know, it's something I'm also super, super into is, uh, is toys and toy design. So I'm going to randomly generate a pair of toy adjectives and toy nouns, I guess, and uh, smush them together, and we'll kind of talk about what that could be like or what's, what's interesting about that pairing. So I cannot wait. If you're ready. Okay, sounds like you are. <laughs> this one is a no mess board game. What what about Jumanji style where everything's magnetized Ooh. to it so it doesn't leave the board? Are we talking about the real Jumanji though? Because that's a lot of mess involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it has something to do with lasers or like, right, like, like a um... projection or some something like that where there's not actually a physical board. Hmm. Because I've seen those, like, at the mall, they'll have, like, a, a projection game that's, like, just projecting an image on the ground, and you have to, like, go, like, pop all the bubbles, that kind of thing. Because that's kind of like a board game, but you don't actually have to even touch anything, let alone have materials to make a mess with. I guess... That's crazy. If you want a truly no-mess board game, you just make a video game. Yeah, when do we get to the point where all board games are all in one? Like, they just... It's like a blank screen, and then they, they just transfer to a different game. Like, instead of getting everything out, you have a whole, or a whole closet of 20 board games just condensed down into a giant flat screen that's very flexible and malleable and indestructible. And, hey, I want to play Monopoly. Maybe halfway through, save the game, and then go to a different game, so that way you don't lose your progress. Dude, that that's great. New, yeah, no you mess. could totally... You could use, like, the... Um the kind of like Kindle type of technology where it like can save your place and like remember all these like details about it and then just like wipe the screen clean and here's the new one. That's a great idea. And then it could almost be like a comiXology or like one of those, you know, phone and tablet comic apps where it can, you know, it, you can buy stuff through it and just read it on there. Like if you want, you know, the um, pieces and and the board to play Monopoly, you just pay, you know, like three ninety nine or whatever and then you have Monopoly on your your tablet or whatever this device is. That's really cool. Like, you don't have to go just buy ima just pieces. Just imagine the, li the licensing for all that stuff, though. <laughs> yeah, but then again, if you're like, you <sighs> know, Milton Brasley or if you're Hasbro, you could just make one and it only has Hasbro games on it. That could be kind of cool. Yeah, you could easily market your own and, you yeah. know, just go with it. I mean, 
they have such an arsenal of board games, most of those companies, that mm-hmm. they could do it. I mean, Fantasy Flight could do it. They'd have enough games to do it. Oh, that'd be yeah, awesome. They'd be really crazy in terms of complexity, <laughs> but True. I'm sure they could do it. Yeah, that that's a really fun idea. Like, I, I really actually want this, <laughs> like, now. <laughs> it sounds super fun. All right, let's do another random pairing here. And this is a self-propelling card game. What? <laughs> um... It's. It sounds like it's like Transformers the card game, where the cards can probably do something. They're not really cards. They're like thick cards, and they uh-huh. can transform and propel themselves to like attack the other side. I'm. I'm almost picturing it like you know certain cards have certain properties, like where when you lay this one down, it just shoots straight forward, or when you lay this one down, it like rotates 180 degrees or like starts spinning around. So it's. It's almost like um. Kind of like Beyblades. Did you guys were you in on that that fad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might have been. I was so yeah. into that. Like I shouldn't have been, but I was so into it. Like I remember having like dreams about Beyblades because I thought they were so cool. Um, but anyway, I think that you know a Beyblade is essentially just a spinning top that you put into like a bowl to to crash into other people's tops. Like that's not very interesting. But this could kind of take that mechanic, but kind of turn it on its head, where you know. It's imagine you took a, a spinning top and you spin it and set it down, but instead of just going downhill and following a predictable pattern, it like does like a three hundred and sixty and then jumps like six inches to the right. It'd be like, What the heck just happened? It's almost like battling robots that have a preset program of, of what they're going to attack with, like how they're gonna move around the field. I was gonna say too, you could take it one step further and do it um, as if it's like you know a fortress, and you're attacking the other person's fortress, and it's just oh, uh, made out of cards. That's, that's really cool. Good. So, do you build like a house of cards? Is that what you're picturing? Like you get to build your own defenses, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah, you would like set up your own <sighs> thing, and uh, uh, if cards have properties, you could easily you know have different types of cards and fortifications, and even uh, uh, stationary cards that you know launch other things. Other wow, types of cards. that's These are be really some exciting. Pretty dur- some pretty durable cards. Yeah, yeah, they're well, a they proprietary plastic. <laughs> These are high-end materials. That's really cool. I think that's very interesting. I'm trying to picture how you would like package these. Like, are they a blind box? Like, do you know that you're gonna get the you know super fortification card, or is it kind of like you know Magic or Pokemon, where for the most part, when you're buying just a pack, you have no clue what's gonna be in there. Which I kind think of it would have to be trading card game style? Yeah, which I I'm obsessed with trading card games. I'm so into it. But just the, the fact I, sh- I was I was picturing these almost weighing different amounts. You know, if one's got like a really high heavy duty like motor that it needs to move, or one of them's really heavy, so it's hard to knock off the table, then it's going to weigh different amounts. Like you're going to pick up the pack and be like, oh, this has one of those really good rare ones in it. Hmm. I think they got to be like spring loaded, or it could be pullback, like a you know, like a car where you pull it backwards and it drives forwards. But each one's going to be a little bit different, you know. Like some of them, maybe you pull to the left and it drives to the right, or you push back on the bottom right corner and it like does a somersault. You know, like they could have totally different properties because they are kind of like transformers, like you said, where they're they're each you know they might look the same at first, but they're actually engineered to be totally different as far as the mechanics of each card. You could even go uh, like Skylanders, Disney Infinity style, where the Ooh. cards are just the uh, the thing that set it up, and you have to buy things to actually launch cards and stuff. Uh huh. I mean, that's that's a route you could go. Obviously, it yeah. works in some cases. I like that, and you could have it almost like where it's you have like a remote controlled castle kind of thing, like where it's got like a little launcher to shoot cannons, and it's got you know a door that opens or something, and then to get it to attack, you have to have the right card so it's like you're doing a you're playing a card game and then next to you is your actual physical castle that's like responding to what you just did in the game so if you're building up your fortifications it's like it's raising the hp of your castle and your walls are less likely to fall down so this is really cool i feel like it makes more sense like from a like manufacturing standpoint to just do this as an app or you know a a mobile game yeah Uh, (laughs) because i mean in a way it's almost like clash royale or something you know which I, I think that's really frustrating. Like, you'll come up with a really cool toy idea, and you're like, oh, that's an app that already exists. Or, like, this would make so much more sense as an app. Because, you know, toys are just more fun. Like, I love collecting physical cards instead of, you know, buying a thing, like a in-game purchase for a, a mobile game. I think it's way more fun to buy the physical thing. Yeah, I've uh, played Magic online, but there's there's nothing that, you know, beats physical cards. Mm-hmm. 
that one is kind of cool. I like the self-propelled card game. I, that, that sounds really fun. All right, uh, if you guys are ready, let's get into Capcom. So Capcom is a video game company. They make video games, and they've been making video games since the early 80s. Uh, Capcom is a combination of the word capsule and computer um, because, you know, they originally made, like, hardware for arcade cabinets, which it's kind of a, a common, you know, origin story for early video game companies. They're like, well, we already make, you know, physical video game entertainment. Why not start making the games for this machine? And uh, they've made a ton of amazing games over the years. So this is, like, super, super ripe to make a theme park of. Like, I would say maybe even more so than Nintendo, which was the first episode of this podcast. So um, this has one, been one that's been on my list of episodes I want to do since day one. Like, since way before the first episode was recorded that I wanted to do Capcom. <laughs> but it's so ambitious. There's so much to cover. What do you guys love about Capcom? Like, why would you want to pick this topic? Like any large game uh, developer, you you have a lot of franchises, and anytime you have a lot of franchises, it's interesting to combine them mm -hmm. in different ways. Uh, Capcom is known for their Versus series, where they combine themselves with other people, and that's, that's part of what makes the theme park great, is when you combine different things. That's true, and that is a good point, that Capcom themselves are like pretty self-referential, and like there's Easter eggs in almost every Capcom game that references other Capcom games, so... Their franchises play nice together, um, or you know, cross pollinate really smoothly. I think so. So yeah, that's that's definitely something that this game company has that I super value that not every game company has. Yeah. Um, Chris, is there anything you love about Capcom? Uh, Mega Man. <laughs> Heck yeah, yeah. Mega Man is awesome, and um, I. I Man, it's such a great franchise. We did a whole episode, a full like Mega Man theme park, a uh, couple episodes back, and um, I think we might be able to do some kind of connection. You know what I mean? Like have a huge Capcom theme park, and then have the Mega Man segment of that, which was essentially like a a very high end next generation laser tag park, where each park guest had their own Mega Mega Buster. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. And they basically ran around and there's different courses representing different levels fighting different robot masters. So um yeah, that that was a pretty cool park. And um yeah, like I said, there's so many things that Capcom has done over the years. It's almost hard to like list them. So I feel like we should just kind of talk about, you know, the specific ones that we really want to hit, but for the listener if you're interested in these properties, definitely just check out list of Capcom games on Wikipedia. There are so many. There's a lot more than you realize. I mean, yeah. you think about the the core franchises, um, but there's a lot of other minor ones that not a lot of people have heard of. True, and and Capcom even put out a lot of games that you wouldn't really necessarily associate with Capcom. Like, um, they've done a lot of Disney games, like uh, Aladdin, Little Mermaid, Ducktales. <laughs> Yeah, which would fit in with our uh, our Disney Afternoon theme park from last season. <laughs> it's kind of fun. There's a lot of uh, a lot of like cross promotion with different episodes in this one. But um, and Capcom was also really innovative in a few different genres of video games, especially with like uh, Street Fighter Two was like the first breakout fighting game. Um, let's see, Resident Evil was one of the first survival horror games, and that's like a hugely popular franchise. And then Mega Man totally redefined platformers, especially, like, platformers where you can shoot a projectile. Like, there's nothing that even compares to that, and it's it's been going for, you know, so many years by now. It's crazy. Yeah, I don't know how many games they have. Uh, it's, it's, it's it's pretty out ton. of control. Yeah, it's a ton. Absolutely. Um, so, with this, it's, it's almost hard. Like, usually on this show, we start with, like, kind of the hub, like, what do we want to accomplish with this park in general? Like, what's it going to look like? So, for example, on the Spider-Man one, it was like, well, uh, something about New York City, right? And then we start from there. But with Capcom, I don't know that there's, like, a central location. You know what I mean? 
if you think about yeah. the fighting games, like like Marvel versus Capcom or Capcom versus SNK, like there are certain stages that appear a lot, like you know iconic locations from various franchises. But is there one that would be a really good like starting point, or should this be something maybe more abstract? Is Street Fighter their most popular? I would franchise? say it's definitely one of the top ones. I would I would definitely say Street Fighter is mm-hmm. the most popular and most recognizable. I think Mega Man has a large following, but I think more people would say they've played a Street Fighter game as yeah. opposed to a Mega Man game. With the most recent Mega Man games, they haven't been doing well. Maybe the Mega Man games are not as well in uh, the public eye right now. So I would say that like, you have Resident Evil and Street Fighter and Marvel vs. Capcom might be their biggest hitters. So maybe we can start the park entrance from one of those three. You could even do it in the style of, like, a start menu, you know? Oh, that's good. That's interesting. Like, the, the character select thing, or the before that, when it just shows, do you want to do single-player, multiplayer, training? Yeah, you could do, like, that for, like, the entrance, and then go into, like, a character selection opening with all the shops and stuff. That's cool. Um, There was a game, I'm, I want to look it up really quick, that I had for, for PlayStation 3, and it was, like, it was really interesting because it was one of those... A, like a game that just is a collection of small older games and it was basically a whole history of Capcom and it, the way it was structured was by its history so like you basically you started with their like original games the first ones that came out and then as you play that you unlock more recent like maybe more well known more popular games but it's kind of cool it like kind of forced you to go through the the old stuff that people haven't heard of first and kind of realize, like, the origins of Capcom, which was a really interesting structure. I don't know that it works necessarily for a theme park, but it was like, I would have never played this game if they didn't make me play it in order to un- unlock the games <laughs> I really wanted. <laughs> it was called That's... Capcom Arcade Cabinet. Okay, I've, I've heard of that one. It was an interesting setup. We, we could definitely so, do something with an arcade as well. I definitely yeah. think you're onto something with the arcade cabinet. Like, maybe it's a giant, or, like, the entrance is a giant arcade cabinet, mm-hmm. and, like... You walk in, maybe it's like twenty story, well, ten stories tall, and you you walk through it, and then you see the guts of an arcade because that's, I mean, Whoa. that's how they got their start was the in the guts yeah. of an arcade kind of. That's how they get their start. So maybe that's how you start through the park, and how they started, and like how you said in the Scooby Doo uh, episode, how like there's like a rogue gallery museum. This mm-hmm. could be like a mini Capcom museum yeah. of like maybe many milestones for Capcom. Like a walk through history. That's yes. really cool. And and they do have some, like, uh, I don't want to get too nerdy here, but Capcom is kind of famous for some of their hardware that they use on the arcade side of things. Um, and so you could have, like, uh, you know, maybe a certain, like, a store is located in one of these, like, one of their famous, like, big chip pieces. Um, like an iconic piece of hardware, in other words, could be turned into like a building because it's, you know, at least a story or two tall. That's, that sounds really cool. And I was also picturing we could just do it as, um, maybe a more regular scale, actual like arcade. And so you come over to the arcade cabinet for Darkstalkers and maybe the arcade arcade cabinet, like you hit a button and it slides to the side and then you like walk behind it or something. Like there's like some kind of parallel to getting into the game. And then there's a part of the theme park that's dark stalkers themed just behind that door. Like that's your, your hub. You pick the arcade game you want to play and then you get like immersed into it. Like literally you go into the game. I mean, not literally, but <laughs> metaphorically you go into the game and then you get to experience all the, the cool stuff that's based on whatever property that is. Yeah, you could even do it, and uh, not necessarily something that moves, but you could even just outline, you know, an entrance to a part of the park and whatever it came on, like a cartridge or a disc, you know. That works. Whatever it is. Yeah, that's a good point. Not all their games were arcade hits, you know. I mean, a lot of them were, but you know, especially once you get into like Mega Man and Onimusha, there's <laughs> again, there's so many games. They weren't all in arcades <laughs> out at a point, you know what I mean? So they could have just been a Super Nintendo game. In which case, it would make more sense to go through some sort of portal that's Super Nintendo esque. I like. So, it. do we want to make the main entrance the giant arcade, or like you know how arcade galleries now are going the way of the dinosaur? What if this is like one of the like we rebuild an arcade and it has all Capcom 
arcade games in it, even recent games, mm -hmm. like brought up to like a cabinet standard. And then behind that is the park. You totally could. So like you walk through the arcade and come out on the other side and you're in the theme park at that point? Something like that. Yeah, that would totally work. I, I love the icon of having a giant arcade machine that you enter through. I think that's so fascinating. And, you know, maybe the inside is, is more like a museum. Like, it shows you the history of Capcom, and it uses kind of the metaphor of, like, the circuitry and the different components that are inside of an arcade machine to, like, visually represent the, the timeline and the history. And I, I think that's really a fascinating visual. I really am into that. What about um, in terms of, like, I mean, just thinking season pass, you know, ticketing? You could even Ooh. do it in some sort of – because Disney does magic bands. You mm -hmm. could do something with controllers or even joysticks with Capcom. Oh, oh, wow. That's cute. Yeah, I'm into that. That's really cool. Make it something people, you know, want to collect because – What if yeah. it's like a, um, like a token? But, I mean, that might be easily lost, but like a – like I, an arcade token or something like that? I think collectible arcade tokens is a cool idea because uh, Capcom's really early games were, I, I forget what the, there's like a subgenre. I think it's called like metal games or something where you get like arcade tokens as a prize. So having collectible tokens or definitely collectible something. And we were kind of talking about like, you know, we just mentioned it for a second, but like a character select screen, because a lot of these games are fighting games. There's tons of characters to choose from. So each one has like a little portrait of each different character and having like that icon of each possible character as a collectible is really fun. So, you know, whether it's a lanyard or maybe it is just like a bracelet, like maybe copy Disney a little bit more closely, but it's got, you know, the character's specific face on it. So you kind of get to pick your character and then you have some kind of token, some kind of memento that not only allows you access to the park, but also you get to keep and like try to collect, you know, your favorite three fighters or whatever. Yeah, I really like that season pass idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, make it something you know people want to have. Yeah, and I, I think maybe the reason why I love Capcom, you know, even over other large video game companies, is because their properties play so nicely together that it kind of gets like a kind of collectible feel to it. And I think that's largely through their fighting games, where they they mash up all these different Capcom characters from different even different genres of video games. And like, yeah, but what if they all were, you know, fighters? Like, they were all in the same field of, like, equality where they can fight each other, even though, you know, one of them is, like, a little girl and a robot and another one is, like, a zombie fighting, like, guy with a gun. Like, yeah, they can fight, whatever. Let's let's even the playing field for them. So <laughs> I, the, when, when you see them all as equals, it's like now it's a collectible thing. Now I got to catch them all. And that really gets, like, my... Me, me really excited and I really want to like take part in that and try to catch you know collect <laughs> catch oh my god <laughs> try to collect all my favorite characters so I, I just it's, I really appreciate that and I think that should be represented in the park you know one way or another it's definitely something that you don't normally get with a lot of game developers is uh, a fusion of their game properties it's normally like a what if scenario mm -hmm. um, in terms of talking about game developers and their games like you know what if mass effect met dragon age but it's more like capcom does it they make it happen and i think i that goes along with what you're saying you know it it's nice to see and you know you you get to live that fantasy in, in a non-traditional way with the fighting game most times yeah absolutely that's that's super cool i'm so into that um and because these these characters are referenced in each other's games like um there's a game i've got uh, dead rising for example there will be mm -hmm. like posters and little like dolls and characters of all these other Capcom games within that world. I feel like that just allows this theme park to be much more flexible where, you know, if you go to like, I don't know, a, a theme park and you see like a Navi, like one of the avatar creatures walking next to Mickey Mouse, it's like, this is weird. Like, what is this? But I feel like in a Capcom <laughs> park, you know, that's okay. Like, if, if you see two Capcom characters passing each other in the theme park, it's like, this makes sense. You know, I've seen these two in the same game before, so them being in the same physical space, I'm fine with that. So It's it's believable. Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily need to be, like, segregated, you know? Like, where Disney World, you don't want certain characters from certain properties kind of mixing. It's fine to have characters cross-pollinate.
So where do we go from that? You know what I mean? You've gone through this huge, like, amazing history of Capcom, this giant arcade machine, which, by the way, I bet the music sounds amazing in there because you're actually inside the machine. That's really cool. Um, And then you come out, and, you know, you're in the world of Capcom. And I guess there doesn't necessarily need to be a specific, like, hard structure to it. But do we want to do, like, sub areas for each different property? Well, there's many things we could do. Um, we, me and John were just talking about it, like, um, how, like, Street Fighter is kind of culturally different, how it's almost like an Epcot, where you could have a circle of fighters, they're all from different places, I mean, we have Dead Rising and Resident Evil, which are pretty similar, uh, we could do, like, a Dead Rising leads into Resident Evil, for, like, a, you have Dead Rising, which is mostly for kids and teens, and then you get to the scarier park, part of the park which is for adults and then you have monster hunter which is pretty huge also and that that can be its own park all all entirely we can do anything with this stuff yeah you're totally right so much stuff (laughs) i think splitting it up like sort of like by theme is a good idea like by tone i guess like your horror games should lead into each other your kind of like colorful bright poppy games can kind of go together like um power stone and like I don't know, I guess Street Fighter, Final Fight, those kinds of games are, like, sort of similar because they're fighting games with, like, colorful characters. And maybe Beautiful Joe, those could all go together. Um, and then, yeah, you know, your your other ones, your kind of stragglers, if they don't match in specifically with one of the other properties, you can kind of put them with something that's sort of close or they could have their own, like, small areas. So, okay, cool. I'm starting to wrap my head around this. This is starting to sound really cool. <laughs> um, yeah. So there is definitely, like, a kind of horror element to this. Like, um, Ghosts and Goblins is a really, like, popular, really difficult platformer. And then there's Dark Darkstalkers, which is, like, a horror-slash-classic-monster-themed fighting game. And then Resident Evil and Dead Rising, yeah. And so Dead Rising and Resident Evil, for the most part, are survival horror type games like they're kind of scary halloweenish type of stuff whereas ghosts and goblins and dark stalkers are not necessarily scary but they are kind of like a gothic type of type of feel to it so i think that i like the structure of having it almost like a, a linear path where you go from ghosts and goblins which is kind of cartoony but still a little bit dark and then maybe to like Dark Stalkers and uh, oh, and Devil May Cry as or yeah, Devil May Cry would work as well here because that's another Capcom franchise that's kind of dark in tone. And then you would get into the Dead Rising, and then like the end part of it, the like, you know, must be eighteen or whatever. You would get to the Resident Evil area. You know what I I really want to see with the Dead Rising portion is something that involves taking pictures, just because of how integral that is to Dead Rising. And the first one, it's like you take pictures of things to get points. I think that'd be cool to have something that people can interact with that's not necessarily a ride, for instance. Like, like, like Pokemon Snap kind of thing. Yeah, because I mean, in Dead Rising, you had certain like things that were like photo ops and if you took pictures you got bonus experience and stuff and you could you could do something with that but that is kind of the, the franchise is kind of about um you know discovery finding new stuff and being able to build additional like weaponry and things like that because you get some really wild like outlandish weapons in those games and you know having the park guests build weapons maybe is not the best idea but allowing them <laughs> <laughs> to unlock collectibles you know get a little trading card of like the chainsaw sledgehammer combo. Like, that's kind of cool. Like, having a collectible, you don't want them to actually carry the physical item around because that's uh, a little sketchy. Um, you could sell Star from one for I, kids. I was just going to say that. I bet you could have fake ones, especially if we're going to have a big Monster Hunter area, which is a, a game kind of based around having, like, ridiculously huge weapons. Um, that could that could work. Maybe we just have, like, a, a really good, you know, foam smith who can make foam weaponry based on these franchises because now that, that what I'm... they're called foam smiths? Oh, oh yeah foam smiths they're like blacksmiths who make foam <laughs> foam weaponry i learned about that on this podcast from <laughs> talking to somebody cool. i don't remember oh it was from the dungeons and dragons episode uh my guest peter knew all about you know foam foam weapon production he's like I, yeah i know a guy who's a foam smith <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> So we talked about, like, um, 
collectibles and stuff. Are we getting? You know how the big thing with the consoles now is achievements. Are we going to do something with achievements, like if milestones, like if you if you take a certain picture of something at a certain amount of time, you get a certain amount of points, or like you you make a weapon that no one has made before. You walk the most amount of steps in the park, or something like that. Are we going to make it like a video game? I, I'm so into that. Like, Having the player's choices and their actual physical actions mean something, like basically including them in, in the story or giving them their own story, I think is so crucial to like the next generations of theme parks because it gets boring just going around and riding roller coasters. You know what I mean? You want to have like some kind of narrative for yourself. Even like Pokemon Go, which I say is a terrible game, it's still really popular, and I still play it once in a while, just because it, it I'm having a physical impact, and like there are things assigned specifically to me. Like I don't know, it, it makes you feel like you're a part of it. It's really cool. So I definitely think we could do, you know, that kind of a thing, keeping track of a player's achievements, and maybe that's how you get tokens. Like we kind of were talking about that that metaphor of having tokens. Like those could be a mm-hmm. physical thing. And maybe you have to pay tokens to get into like the next area if you want to, like. Or you have to do, you have to get enough achievements to unlock the next area, like in a real video game. That's cool, and we could we could continue the, um, the like arcade kind of uh, theming that we were going with. Like maybe you have to put you know additional tokens into some kind of like coin slot at some point to get through to the next area, the next world. I like that structure. You brought up Pokemon Go. Augmented reality is becoming a big thing now and we could do so many things with augmented reality at this park you could do like mega man you could actually shoot things out of your blaster but it re- it wouldn't be physical it would just be digital or you could have zombies chasing you or you could have you know you could maybe fight somebody in street fighter with augmented reality it's just how far do you we want to go with the interactivity for this park? I like that. Um, do you have any specific thoughts on that, John? Well, I think we can only go so far. Uh, you have to consider the older crowd that may not take to it. So that's why you do more of the traditional stuff. But augmented reality is like a serious thing. And so I think you could do a lot with augmented reality in terms of just the things you can't physically staff, just having you know, tons and tons and tons of characters everywhere or NPCs in the background. You can't always staff that with real people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I like that a lot. I like the idea of having, you know, virtual reality or augmented reality for specific areas. Like, that would be really exciting for, like, the Resident Evil area to to walk through an actual corridor and then, you know, whatever kind of creature jumps out and, like, you have to, like, shoot at it. I think that'd be so fun. But if you had a physical thing jumping out at your park guests like you might accidentally hurt them or something so you don't want to do that Mm -hmm. but so i do think that certain experiences would be way better with vr or ar but the general park should still be themed and still be really cool because um there is a kind of in my opinion a sad version of the future like what are theme parks going to be like in 30 years realistically they might just be a bunch of really high-end vr machines side by side oh, man you know what i mean and you walk in there and it's just yeah. a bunch of black pods and like there's not even something cool you see on the drive-in it's just like you get there and you're like oh it's a parking lot with a bunch of black pods like that's not fun it's not themed like you don't get to actually walk around and interact with anything at that point so i like the idea of using vr and ar but not like exclusively but i mean i'm sure that's not what you wanted to go for but that is just something that mm-hmm. i'm always worried about i'm like is that the ultimate future? Is that what my grandkids are going to think of when they think of theme parks? Like, oh, yeah, those really, like, high-end VR places? Those kind of suck. I'll tell you, I, we, we can do augmented reality and virtual reality as long as at some point in the park we have some animatronic robots. Yes. <laughs> I, I yes. love robots in theme parks. Like, all those rides, I love them. Yeah. I totally like that. And, and some of these could be costumed characters, like, you know, people we pay to kind of get in character, especially the, the humans, obviously. Um, but you definitely would want to have some, some robot characters because they're either not a shape that you can fit a human inside of or, you know, they would just work better as an actual authentic robot. I think that's super fun. That's that's great. And I think Capcom has a lot of mascots that they could do for the, for the robot characters. Beautiful Joe is... I'm not sure exactly how big he is, but in the games, he seems really short, like very chibi, like you will be too short to be played by like an adult human. So maybe you mm-hmm. have like a beautiful Joe one. 
Um, hmm. He's about krill in size. Yeah, that's what I'm picturing. So, you know, maybe you could just get a, a short human. Um, there's also the, the serve bots, which come from the Mega Man Legends games, and they're oh, super wow. adorable. You know, those are some of the first things I think of when I think of Capcom. I think mostly because they are the colors of the Capcom logo, so I always, like, closely uh, connect those in my brain. But having little serve bots run around would be really cute. We could almost make Surfbot like the Mickey of uh, Disney World. How you know how there's hidden Mickeys around Disney World? Hidden there's Surfbots. Hidden Surfbots. I like that. I like that a lot. And you could have them um, to kind of get into the like collectability thing. You could have them dress up as the different characters or have different color schemes based on you know what character they're inspired by. That could be really cool. Like you could have a Strider one that's Costuming. kind of that purple color. Yeah, yeah. We just we just don't want them to become too minionized because they do because <laughs> the minions the minions look like them quite a bit yeah you're right it, in my opinion these guys look more like a lego minifigure but just with really cute looking proportions it is such an iconic look that they have i almost like the idea of just having them just be plain uh traditional serve bots and they're just in various places hidden throughout the park you know on top of buildings and like in the sewer drains and stuff. So you can just like kind of see them and maybe you have to snap a picture of them. And it's like, you know, you've got uh, 25 out of 40 serve bots, find them all to, you know, you get a chance to eat, eat lunch with Tron bon or whatever, you know, uh, mm-hmm. specific like unlocks that you get for getting enough achievements. I think that's that pretty fun. neat. Like yeah. a, a contest worked into it daily that yeah. anybody can do. It's not like some exclusive thing you need to pay for. Mm hmm. I'm super into that, and I, I love, um, you know, my, my kind of vision for, like, the future of theme parks. Because it is a little bit more interactive, there's more of a game element to it, you kind of have winners, whereas regular theme parks, it's like everyone gets the same experience. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of okay with giving, you know, these unique premium experiences to people who earned them, not for to people who paid for them. Um, so maybe there are things you can kind of unlock. Like, maybe you they give away a season pass, like, especially if it's a cool, like, collectible... Uh, you know, lanyard or whatever, like they're giving those away once every day to whoever has the highest score in the park or the first person to get this achievement, they get some kind of like permanent reward, whether they get to, oh dude, they get to put their initials in the high score thing on that giant arcade cabinet. I didn't even think about that. (laughs) That's, That's perfect. Because we've got a huge screen. I mean, I kind of forget how tall this was. Did you say like 10 stories? So it could be as big as we want. This is infinity money. So <laughs> True. It's, it's got to be the first thing you see driving from the interstate. Right. And it's got to be at least wide enough to fit, you know, this museum in the bottom. So you got to, you know, figure out how tall that would be in relation to how wide that is. Yada, yada, yada. Anyway, we've got a huge screen that you can see the screen vaguely from the, the highway. And the screen kind of cycles through maybe, you know, some of Capcom's like greatest hits. And then at the end, it, like, stops on the the high scores. And it either shows initials, probably just initials, because if we want to go for, like, an old-school arcade cabinet. Because, um, yeah, th- that works. I like that a lot. Maybe you get to have, um, you get to customize a character, like, a little pixel art character to represent you to put them there. Like, they do, like, um, <laughs> kind of like doing your portrait. Like, having, okay. uh, instead of doing someone, like, draw a caricature of you, they do, like, a, you know, high-quality 2D sprite art version of you that would that would make sense in, like, the Street Fighter Two kind of art style. That'd be awesome, and they could use a snippet of that for your high score to go with your initials. Yeah, that could be something that definitely gets done. Um, it's not too out of the, you know, box that you could actually make that happen and then just show them up there. Mm-hmm. And as an artist, I think that'd be way more interesting, you know, not that I'm like a, a caricature artist type of person, but I would totally do that as a summer job if you could be a pixel art guy and just like do pixel art versions of people. I'm like, yes, pay me minimum wage. I will do this all day. <laughs> yeah, and it's almost fun, you know? Yeah. Uh, some of those caricature guys don't look like they're having that much fun. <laughs> right. I would have fun doing pixel if, art. Yeah, seriously, if I have to draw another giant nose on like some dumb kid, uh, God, <laughs> caricatures seem, seem kind of rough. Um, but pixel art is legit. I'd also like to see, um, and uh, most theme parks have shows. I think you could do um, 
some like live action, you know, staged fight Street Fighter shows. I think that'd be kind of cool where you have different people dressed as the characters. Yeah. And this it would basically would be like a martial arts exhibition, you know. This this mm-hmm. uh it does have some fantasy elements to it, especially with like Dal Sim and Blanca, for example. But a lot of the characters are just really awesome martial artists. So you could actually have them, you know, spar and like physically fight. And there's ways to make it believable to the audience, you mm-hmm. know. And especially with uh, you know, some of the out there characters like Doll Sim and uh, and Bison, you know, flying through the air. <laughs> right. You could you could make it happen. You just have yeah. to yeah. reserve yeah, them for like special occasions. Yeah, and they would have to, you know, maybe do a little bit more choreography so you can have uh the Hadoken blast and stuff go through um looking somewhat authentic. But you know, Capcom's got some really amazing graphics. Like uh Super Street Fighter Four looks pretty awesome. Um so using that level of graphics kind of mixed in with like actual actors, I think you could do something with that. That sounds that sounds pretty you, sweet. You can even do I mean, you can make people look that way with just uh makeup, you know. And mm-hmm. some people do some pretty amazing uh cell shaded makeup which yes. you could easily do to uh to people in costume. Yeah, I love that. And, and and that totally works for the characters who are just kind of walking around the park as well. Like, uh, you know, people you can get their signature from, Ken from Street Fighter, for example. Like, just have a, a buff dude in, like, a red, you know, uh, whatever you call those things. And, uh, yeah, that would look awesome, doing the cell shading makeup. That's so great. Oh, and um, maybe during those, you know, uh, special effects, like, fight choreography exhibitions... Once in a while, the Hadoken comes out red instead of blue, which is like a limited thing, like a 1% chance of that happening. Like, if you get a picture of that happening, you definitely, like, automatically get an achievement for the red Hadoken. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hadoken! I'll tell you, I like the idea of a roller coaster that is one version of the roller coaster, but then there's a turbo version of the roller coaster, <laughs> just as a play on Capcom's ability to re release the same game, but with turbo or super or ultra at the end i love that that's really fun and you know maybe it's like they've got the kid version of the ride and then there's like a a higher thrills version of the ride and yeah you just slap ultra or you know alpha three or whatever at the end of it (laughs) our uh, our third member mario had the idea of a versus coaster where you would pick your your section so it'd be like you know Capcom versus Marvel versus SNK versus Street Fighter versus you know, Final Fight and but there'd be like three versions of the same roller coaster running almost uh kind of like the old roller coasters that used to run one one way and one the other way. That's really cool. That sounds super fun. If you got maybe a little bit more specific with it like where it's a specific character like you know maybe you start the line for the Street Fighter 2 ride and then there's like eight different characters you can select from, and you go down the specific queue line, and you get in the the E Honda car, and like that ride experience is like inspired by E Honda, and it's got like E Honda color theme, color scheme, and like sound effects, and uh, yeah, that'd be really fun. Maybe specific parts of the action of that roller coaster are, are inspired by his attacks. Well, I'm telling you that that cami section of that roller coaster is. That's going to be a long line. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, oh boy. The design of the Street Fighter, the Street Fighter Park, it, do we just want that to be like a giant street? I don't know. I like the idea of going, um, kind of representing all the different characters' nationalities. Like, a lot of times in, in at least the older um, Street Fighter games, there was kind of like a map of the world. And when you're going to different stage select options it shows you where in the world that stage is basically embracing that in maybe a less wonky way would be really cool when you can do um like basically excerpts of all these different cultures from around the world that these characters come from i think that'd be really interesting and that could be done through you know just like a little shop or a little restaurant dining experience that's inspired by the part of the world where that character comes from. I think that would be really Mm -hmm. interesting and like add more to it. Like, it's not just about fighting. You know what I mean? Like, uh, what does Blanca, you know, like eat for dinner instead of like, yeah, that's the guy who like punches people and does like a weird backflip kick thing. It's like, yeah, but there's more to him, you know? Yeah. Just getting a little bit of the culture in there too, Mm -hmm. uh, with the levels even because you can recreate the scenery there. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, maybe you take the the inspiration for like the dining experience or the bar or whatever you want to have in that area and make it kind of decorated like 
their classic stages, their their levels that they usually fight in. Do we add the other fighters in the Capcom arsenal? Like, you know, if the Final Fights, the uh, Marvel, the SNK, the Fatal Fury. They've done so many crossovers. Um, we definitely could. Um, it's not like we're hurting for different licenses to put in here just because Capcom is so way over the top with what they've accomplished already. But they've got good relationships with all these other companies that also have a big family of characters that work well in the same game. So you could certainly expand this to have, you know, like the Capcom version of Marvel, they get an area. You know, the Capcom version of the SNK characters, they get an area. That'd be really interesting. It allows you to open up for so many more characters to, like, unlock and to interact with and to have, you know, experiences themed around. I think the admin area, you know, for employees should be Ace Attorney themed because I, I don't think you can throw it anywhere else and people be interested in it. So yeah. why not do it for the employees? That's really fun. Um, so Ace Attorney games are, are basically a, a courtroom experience. Like there's you have to gather evidence, you have to interview people and then you go to actual courtroom like uh, the actual like you are the attorney like the series is called Ace Attorney for a reason. And so I do think that's a difficult theme to weave in there, but I, I like those games so much that I think, in a way, it's like having a, like a Law and Order theme park. Like, that's pretty weird, but it might be a fun, like, just one little experience, like one little area that's set up like a courtroom, and, yeah, I don't know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? It is odd. I mean, you could do, like, a an entire park kind of collect mm-hmm. evidence thing. Maybe it could be like uh, an the, escape room. Like a, you have one hour to to gather uh, information. Then you get uh, an hour to like, I don't know, maybe you get 20 minutes to look for clues, 20 minutes to interrogate people, and then you have a 20-minute like courtroom scene at the end. It, you could do something with the Ace Attorney. <laughs> it could be a hybrid escape room uh, style, like interactive mm-hmm. movie. Uh, yeah. I did a, a 30 minute escape room at uh, RTX Austin just just this past uh, July, and it was only 30 minutes. But in that 30 minutes, you know, I, you you can get a lot out of a 30 minute escape room. Yeah, and escape that's not rooms something... are so great. If they're if they're designed well, man, they're amazing. And and usually yeah, they're, they're an hour. Amazing. They don't need to be an hour. They can be half an hour. That totally works. How much did you want to involve Mega Man to the park? He has his own section. Yeah, he would definitely get you, his own section. Did you say you already? He's yeah. got an episode already. It's got different like tracks that are set up to be different robot masters at the end. So it's almost uh, like you're going through different platform levels, but it's just like a linear, almost um, like uh, Ninja Warrior kind of stage, but it's all about like laser tag, basically. And so it's AR with enemies popping up, and you have to shoot them, and you can do multiplayer mode or... Um, it's, it also tracked your like your skill. So if you're a kid and you're terrible, um, the enemies aren't going to be very hard to hit, or they won't be shooting any projectiles at you. They're just kind of there, and you're almost on like a sightseeing tour. But if you're like pro level, there's some like really difficult challenge, like ninja warrior type stuff, while you're shooting bad guys, and it got pretty wild. <laughs> so that was basically what the Mega Man area could be. You can just add the Mega Man to the Capcom land. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I think that works. <laughs> Another like uh, game type that Capcom is kind of famous for would be like um, 1942 and Volgus, like basically shooting type games and and also there's a game they made called Dimahu which I don't think that game's very popular but they had it in my really small hometown and so like my friends and I have played Dimahu a lot even though it's like a pretty obscure game but basically one of those games where you are flying from the bottom of the screen towards the top of the screen and there's enemies coming down and you move left and right and shoot them what do you guys think we could do with like that kind of a of the game type is there a way we could translate that into like a ride or an experience 
like a um, almost like a water ride almost where you mm. can have a movable craft that you can lo- only move left or right. It's like on rails. Yeah. But you have things coming towards you. Wow. Like uh, other rafts, maybe people shooting nerf at you <laughs> or water. Yeah. Oh, water, that's great. Water makes more sense, but yeah. That uh, that makes a lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, water does make more sense. So so maybe it's like you're um you know clear from the splash zone like at the bottom of a slide and you know like you said you move left and right so maybe some person is in charge of steering and like the other person is in charge of like shooting the projectiles and it could be like a laser tag type system like when the oh yeah and then there's also the slide in front of you so other people are just like this is a water park we go down the slide but they can kind of get to steer a little bit like they can bounce off the walls if they want to or go straight down or whatever and maybe like their craft, their raft is like lit up like LEDs from the inside or something. And it's like, let's say it's red. And then if you shoot a laser at their craft, it turns blue and it's like not going to hurt you anymore. So they can come down and like land. And then you have to try to shoot the next one really quickly. That that could be super fun. Yeah. And you could even have different paths and stuff that you can go oh. down to just give the uh, the person who's steering, you know, more to do. Make that choice. Yes. That's really cool. You could you could have multiple slides. And it could be uh, yeah, a bunch of slides. Like one of them keeps like spinning around and so like that enemy is kind of hard to hit because they're like spinning and doing a lot of high speed turns. Dude, <laughs> that one was awesome. <laughs> that works so well as a water ride. I would have never thought of that, but that's awesome. Jeez. Oh my gosh, I got another idea for that. Um so the slide itself, like if you have like a one slide that's like kind of big, you could either have it to be painted like a backdrop of like 1942 where you're just kind of, it's like a bunch of land and then water and there's like small tanks and stuff. You could either paint the slide to look like that underneath the water or you could have like a projector or a screen where it actually kind of scrolls. So instead of just having the rafts flow down at you, it looks like you're flying forward. It like has this this optical illusion of you are flying towards the enemy, like the boss, which is going to be at the end of this level. Yeah, I could see that definitely. Where it's it's you're moving, it's moving, so you're moving a lot faster than you are, and you're right. actually you know, make, making ground. I could, oh, it could definitely work. That's awesome. I like that a lot. That sounds super fun. Um, what about the fighting games? Capcom's really well known for their fighting games. Are we gonna have like just a fighting tournament where the guests can uh, get dressed up and beat the crap out of each other? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. I have a high insurance policy. Uh, so many waivers. We could do a VR version of this. And that would be really cool as well. Like, um, and maybe part of it is a training simulation. You know, it's like if you're playing as Chun Li, it's like okay, try to kick you know this high, and then it's like okay, now try to kick down here, and then try to alternate between those really quickly. It's like this is ridiculous. Like humans aren't built to do this, but you know, it, it gives you like you know you are forty percent as good as Chun Li at this. T- at playing this role it could be kind of fun to watch people do it yeah it'd be really embarrassing like vr you look like a dork anyway in vr you know you have the headset on and everything but if you're actually trying to do these street fighter moves oh that'd be so funny How are we going to incorporate Monster Hunter to this Capcom land? That's exactly what I was going to ask. That was on my up to do list as well. <laughs> um, this seems like the hardest part because, like, it's an open world adventure. You could build your own armor, weapons. You fight monsters. How are we going to do this? Well, okay. So, what about doing a Monster Hunter, uh, like? Capcom in the style of Monster Hunter almost, and that sounds weird, but um, if we're giving the player like more of a role to play, like they get to kind of interact with the park and like build their character and stuff like that, maybe they get to get their foam weapons like Monster Hunter, and there are certain enemies they can fight throughout the park. And so there could be like a Monster Hunter area, of course, where there's, you know, big animatronic monsters for them to take down and like, you know, team up with other people to try to fight this one big monster like you do in the games. Um, but you can also take your foam sword and your weaponry, um, out into the main part of the park. And then like maybe in the dark stalkers area, there's like, you know, a big monster. I don't know if it would be a monster hunter themed monster or 
just one of the actual monsters from Darkstalkers that you can fight with the foam weapons. And of course, it's got to be animatronic or AR. You're not going to have like actual giant monsters in the park. But um, basically giving them something to do with that kind of Monster Hunter skill set, imagination set, and carry it forward into the other games. Like the, the Devil May Cry area would make a lot of sense to take a giant you know foam weapon into and fight stuff. The Onamusha area would make a lot of sense for this. Um, the and, Dino Crisis area. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's awesome. And even it's almost um, like a it's almost like a monsters got loose. You have to return them yes. to the Monster Hunter land type of thing. That's really cool. So it's almost like uh, the plot of like Jurassic Park, but instead of being at Jurassic Park, it's at the Capcom theme park. They've escaped from their quarantined area, and they're, like, escaping into the, the main part of the park. That's that's pretty great. And I know that Capcom's got a game coming up called Deep Down, which is, like, a dungeon crawler kind of game. So I'm sure they'll want to be, you know, if we're opening this park, they're like, well, you got to do something with Deep Down. So we could basically do the same kind of thing with just more traditional, like, fantasy-type weaponry. And uh, you can also, you know, have a foam sword that's more realistic or a foam sword that's more monster hunter and still take on the same challenges throughout the park i know john wanted uh john wanted like an underground area for the capcom land because i know and um there's lost planet which part of it takes place underground in like the deep echoey caves the caver- ca- ca- cavernous caves you have resident evil and like in the movies most of the stuff happens underneath the buildings and stuff like that. So we could add a whole nother layer to this park underneath everything. Yeah, I think that's one of the coolest parts of the Resident Evil games is just seeing the outline of like where you are in a specific place. And then, you know, actually being there would be even better. For the um Lost Planet area, would you want it to be kind of like a uh, an on rails shooter kind of thing where you're like on a roller coaster and you're shooting stuff, or do you want to be on foot kind of like exploring around? And then you might find monsters. We do need some more rides, so maybe the Lost Planet might be the ride where it could be kind of cold because it in the uh, in the game it's like the first game, it's uh, it's pretty frozen the uh, outside. So maybe it starts off cold and then you go deeper into the earth, it gets warmer type of thing. There's also what giant monsters and mechs in that, so uh, a large roller coaster ride makes sense at that point. Yes, like you could be in a. you could be in the mech roller coaster, like the mech is your coaster car, yeah, kind of type uh, of thing, rolling around a giant monster, you know, in the center, like you're fighting it, but not really, you know. Mm. That's so cool. There's there's a um, a level in Super Mario Sunshine. You're on an actual roller coaster, fighting like a giant monster in the middle, and uh, like riding the roller coaster and trying to shoot this guy at the same time. It's it it would be that kind of experience, which I think is just thrilling. Like, you know, that's that's like. So exciting because roller coasters are so thrilling in and of themselves. But if you also have to be trying to take down a monster at the same time, it's like I don't have time to be like scared of this roller coaster, to be like super like into the thrills on this coaster because I'm also trying to like shoot this bad guy and track him and make sure he doesn't get too close. That'd be so next level. I'm into it. It's like a faster ver- version of the uh, Buzz Lightyear game at <laughs> uh, at Disney. <laughs> yeah, it's like a pro level version of that. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would work. And you could do Mega Man experiences like that as well. Um, I mean, you could also do a Resident Evil one like that, I guess. Especially from, like, uh, some of the more, you know, action-oriented Resident Evil games. Like Resident Evil, like, uh, 5 or 6, probably. You could do some of those experiences. Like, some of the areas are really intense when you're, like, sliding down, like, a, a tunnel of water. And there's, like, sea monsters and stuff you have to try to take out. You could definitely do that as a what if, coaster kind of thing. Maybe the near the end of the Resident Evil Park is the real co- is the coaster, and it's called Escape, and that's how you get out of the Resident Evil Park. And in, in that ride, you're escaping from the Resident Evil. It's like Nemesis or some other villain is chasing you. It's like very tense. Like there's a like maybe there could be one of those. Um, this could be like a new coaster where you're in the coaster. But there's like a coaster behind you that's kind of chasing you, but not really touching you at the same time. And it has it has like the monster on the coaster, so like people in the back will be like they'll be they could be like touched by the guy kind of thing. But not, it's like a foam type of thing, or people up like a 
maybe from the front you could have like another coaster and they tries it tries to like get the people in the front type of thing it's more thrilling and scary i, I that would scare the crap out of me <laughs> i think it sounds awesome so i you could even do it where it's like um the the like hero coaster is like going down this going down you know the escape area like trying to get out of the park and you start down going forward and like maybe you have to shoot monsters in front of you and then like you know you hear like a big roar behind you and suddenly like all of the cars do like a 180 degree pivot and see yes. you, you're looking backwards yes. now you're still going down the hill like the roller coaster is still moving the same way but now you're shooting behind you at this guy who's chasing you and he's on his own coaster with like riders behind him but it's like this animatronic monster is like the whole front car so you can't even see past him because he's so big, but there's actually people riding on that coaster as well, which, you know, it's just like a pretty straightforward, forward-going coaster, but you've got a big animatronic monster on the front of your car. That'd be really fun. Wow. You could even do this kind of experience with, you know, a coaster going around a monster that's based on Monster Hunter if you have a ranged weaponry. I think that would that would work as well. And even Devil May Cry, like... So many of these are, are games about shooting stuff, essentially, you know, like really cool big monsters. So that works. And um, maybe you could bring your, you know, foam fantasy style uh, firearms into the main part of the park to fight those big monster hunter monsters. You know, you don't just have to have foam swords. You can also use like these Capcom style weapons like Mega Man's blaster and stuff. Not to uh, derail from rides, but I think it'd be really neat in uh, <laughs> in the Dead Rising part of the park. The um, part of Dead Rising is you could eat almost anything. What if you had like miniature versions of like giant, like full full size pies that you could you know, order and eat for food? Just you know, trying to focus not only the settings but the cuisine on where you are as well. I love that. Um, that's really fun, and I'm thinking maybe doing like a whole shopping experience, like. Dead Rising, like, the the mall setup, like, yeah. levels, I love those that's so good. much. That's good. If we had an actual mall, that's like a working mall, shopping mall, where there's people in costume as zombies in all of the, like, walkways. And certain stores, you know, maybe you've only got eight stores you want to have open, but there's ten spots. Two of them are just taken over by zombies, so people don't go in there anymore. But <laughs> it'd be really fun, like, to have, like, a functional shopping experience. But you have to, like, dodge zombies and, like, sneak into the door and, like, slam it shut behind you. <laughs> be so fun. And then you can have a food court as well. You know, you kind of got to get through there quickly because there's, you know, zombies there. But uh, it could be really fun. Or maybe the humans have, you know, quarantined or, like, blocked off that area from the rest of the mall so you can, like, eat in peace. But... It would totally be fun to have, like, a, a Dead Rising-themed food court <laughs> area. And Monster Hunter, too. I mean, you could do, you know, the oh, button yeah. and the potions and all that. Oh, that's great. I'm really into that. Um, that sounds so fun. I think theme park food definitely needs to be brought up to the next level, because right now it's pretty lame. <laughs> Um, what about Okami? Do you guys want to do anything based on Okami? The visuals in that game are stunning. They're beautiful. It, it, it's a game that's kind of got like a painting mechanic to it, but the art style is like really beautiful, cell shaded. Um, it kind of looks like, you know, classic, like old Japanese art style. So I, I definitely think doing that area would be really beautiful, even if it's maybe just, like, a peaceful, you know, like, meadow-type area you can walk through and, like, look at the cool stuff around you. There doesn't necessarily have to be any kind of threat going on. It's just, like, something cool to look at. Definitely, and I know there's, like, a, an interactive paintbrush. Yeah. And I think you could incorporate that and let people um, not necessarily draw on things but interact with things by drawing because uh, you interacted with the game to, to, like, draw wind and stuff, I think. So you could definitely have people do that. I think that's a really cool idea. Like, if you had these these paintbrushes throughout the park, or, you know, throughout this area at least, and maybe there's, like, um, things that kind of look like scrolls or, like, canvases, and you go and, like, put the brush on it, and, like, you know, maybe that activates something, like, that makes, um, 
you know, the, the cherry blossoms start to, like, fall off the tree, or, like, it, it makes something happen in your environment. Or it could just be, like, you get to, to play a different game, or you get to, like, actually do some physical painting. I think you could do some really, like, kind of magical, like, you know, this could be a kid's area, honestly, or just, like, a peaceful area to kind of chill. Because you could do some fun, like, art-based magic experiences. Yeah, you definitely could. Especially just, you know, having an area where people can kind of relax and not have to, you know, be immersed in that sort of thing. But at mm-hmm. the same time, you are immersed. Right. It's it's like the world is consistent around you, but it's not demanding of you. Like, you're allowed to to just enjoy it and, like, be a part of it. What do you guys think? Are there other games that we should talk about? Specific parts we, like, really got to add in here? Because this thing's awesome already. What do you think? You can kind of pepper in some of the lesser-known games uh, for the diehard fans throughout. Uh, obviously, with the other fighting games that we didn't really touch on, you can throw them in the Street Fighter area. Mm-hmm. And like uh, Power Stone is one of my like favorite, like less popular games that Capcom made. And pretty much all you would need to do for that is either add those characters to our pre-existing fighting areas, or because that game had weapons in it, you could just add those weapons to the weapons shop throughout the the park. You know, when if we have like firearms and also like sword type weapons, just use the power stone weapons and then call it a day. It's not like you have to have a specific uh, roller coaster or something based on every single property. Yeah, and you can definitely use it to uh, sort of gauge the popularity of these older titles if you're Capcom and just uh, see what people are interested in having brought back. Because I know Capcom need some help sometimes so yeah theme park i think that's great and if we have the kind of collectible you know thing going on where you can kind of try to collect your favorite characters yeah just track that you know what i mean like how many people are getting this specific character and if nobody's getting them then we just get rid of that character and maybe replace them with someone else or if one character is insanely popular move them more towards the forefront you know like include maybe a story element about them i like taking that kind of subtle customer feedback like just kind of following their behavior patterns and using that to make your park a better place for them and also making capcom look better you know you being there the the kind of public face that you can interact with of capcom i think that's a, a really cool thing that not many companies get to have i'm an optimistic person i hope that eventually this is kind of what theme parks become i i'm really hoping that like you know there, there's definitely a possible future where Escape rooms have had a pretty big boom. You know, maybe that that boom continues to evolve into, you know, additional puzzle rooms and, like, Easter egg hunts throughout, like, you know, different areas. And, like, that that industry keeps growing. And people want to interact with with brands and with characters in this way. And then suddenly, you know, Disney is not the world leader at what they do. You know, Universal is already, like, giving them a run for their money with the the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. If other brands start doing that... This, oh, God, that should be the future. Come on. This is what I want. It definitely has to be something that you go for the experience and not necessarily for the rides because the older theme parks that are going, you know, to the wayside are about the rides, and it needs to be about the entire experience. It needs to be complete experience. Yeah, I I definitely agree. You're totally right, and I think, I think that, you know, classic theme parks are so disjointed. Like, there's someone trying to get you to, like, throw a ball to knock over some pins to win, like a stuffed, you know, Meowth plush, and then someone's trying to get you to, like, throw a basketball into a thing to win a basketball. It's like, what What even is this? You know, like, who cares? But if it was all themed from the same world and, like, people were interested in the items that they would get from these games and the theming from the roller coaster matched in with the merchandise that was available in the store and the games they could play and, like, I don't know, just theme parks aren't really that themed if you think about it in general. It's like, what? I, I guess those are more amusement parks i suppose but i don't know there's just not a ton of theming and i feel like theming should be number one you win even if you've never played a capcom game this would be a very vibrant very beautiful um you know super colorful fun world to go to and if you've never played monster hunter you still might want to get a foam sword and beat the heck out of that giant animatronic monster (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know and if you're if you're like um you're on the lost planet um ride you're not gonna not shoot the monster you know what i mean you're like this roller coaster is awesome but there's still a monster we gotta shoot like 
I don't know. I feel like the theming would grab anyone and pull them in, or, you know, not literally everyone, but most people who would be going to this park, yeah, they'd be along for the ride, and maybe they wouldn't explore every square inch of the park, but they'd at least have a really fun, like, action-filled day. What do we call in this place? Um, like, uh, do we, do we want it to something to do with the arcade, or we do we want to be transcendent of that? I was thinking something. I, I mean, it's it's hard, but just Capcom, the name kind of, I associate capital with it. So I, I don't know if like the name of the park can incorporate that because it's like the capital of Capcom. But I don't, I, I couldn't think of a good name. That was the problem. I like that, or like Capcom City, or something like that. Could be like Planet Capcom. I like that's, Planet Capcom. That's pretty cool. I like that too. Should we include, um, like, Arcade in there somewhere? Like, uh, Capcom's Arcade Planet or something? Then it sounds like an arcade. Uh, What about, like, World of Capcom? I know it's super generic, but we're going into the worlds within the Capcom universe, not just Capcom video games. Hmm, hmm. Because, I mean, that transcends video games almost, which is kind of what we're trying to do here. Capcom Creations, Capcom... Cosmos. (laughs) (laughs) Cosmos. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Capcom Cosmos sounds really great. Wow, it's kind of ridiculous, but it is ridiculous, but it's it's so grandiose and huge. But I think that it, it works because it, it it incorporates like these various kind of universes and kind of mushes them all together. Thank you guys so much for being on. That was really, really awesome. Hey, thanks for having us. It was a, uh, it was an experience. Definitely a pleasure. Would do it again. Five stars. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was really fun. I'm glad we got to like weave together so many diverse like fabrics from the the Capcom Cosmos into one theme park. It, it sounds incredible. Oh man. And there's so many, like, little snippets of this that, like, I'm going to be brainstorming about for, like, weeks to come. Thank you for listening to episode 16, Capcom Cosmos. Remember, you can find us online at reddit.com slash r slash amusement sparks. We're also at facebook.com slash amusement sparks and amusement sparks.com. We're also on YouTube. The channel is called Kuyomi, C-U-Y-O-M-I, and that's where a lot of my future work is going to be on the internet. You can also find us at FancyBat.com, which is a podcast network that we're working on starting up, and you can find us on Instagram, at AmusementSparks. If you'd like to see a live recording of the show, you should come to OhioCon in Columbus, Ohio. It's going to be January 28th is the day I'll be doing my panel. So yeah, super looking forward to that. It's going to be awesome. If you like the show, feel free to give us a review on iTunes. I'm actually going to start reading some of the five-star reviews that we get here on the show. Doing a podcast is rewarding in and of itself, but like having guests that enjoy participating and having people leave reviews for you is like, ah, oh, just makes it all worth it. It's awesome. Here's a five-star review from Podcast Playlist. It says, Super fun idea for a show. The host has a great passion for the show and making up parks. The guest plays along great, and the art for the show is top-notch. Great job. And that really means a lot because, well, A, I do the art myself, and then B, they pointed out that the guests always play along great, which has been amazing. You know, we've had so many different guests on the show, and every single one of them has, like, surprised me at how much they get into it and how helpful they are in the design of the park. So... It's honestly my favorite part of doing a show is, is the guests. The variety of guests is amazing. Here is a five-star review from Just Abby. It says, I love this. Like, I love, love this premise. A good niche topic that is also inventive. Worth a listen. Thank you, Just Abby. That is awesome. And one more five-star review. This one says, Creativity at its finest. A podcast that brings hypothetical situations into my bank of ideas I wish were real. These concepts that are pitched drive me mad that there isn't such a thing already. The creative nature of the very excited host is enough to make you want another episode right when you finish the one you're on. Keep it up. Thanks. That's from the Boondoggle Podcast, who left that review. Thank you to everyone who's left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or on iTunes. 
those really do mean a lot. The next Amusement Sparks episode comes out January 29th, so I'll see you then.